This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229 MRI Signals and Sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The 11th lecture on radial and spiral sequences is divided into two parts. Lecture 11a covers radial and projection imaging. The learning objectives for this lecture are to explain radial and projection sampling schemes, to describe the relationship between the number of spokes, case space extent, and field of view, to describe the point spread function and the impact of off resonance on this point spread function, to explain how radial and projection sampling affects the signal to noise ratio, and to list possible benefits of radial and projection sampling. In radial and projection imaging, we sample spokes. For the purpose of this lecture, we will define radial out as being sampling from the middle out to k max, and projection or full projection as sampling all the way across k space from minus k max to k max. You will notice that these terms are used interchangeably in MRI, so this can be a bit confusing, but for this lecture, we will stick with these definitions. We will talk about the trajectory design considerations, such as the resolution and the number of shots or excitations. We'll talk about the reconstruction, the point spread function, and streak-like aliasing when you undersample. We'll talk about the signal to noise ratio considerations and also about 3D imaging techniques. First, let's look at the projection reconstruction sequence. This is the full projection uh, imaging sequence. So here we sample all the way across K-space as shown by these trajectories here. Notice that the difference between the different trajectories, instead of sampling different lines like in Cartesian imaging, we're sampling at different angles. So the pulse sequence will look like this. The excitation is the same as Cartesian imaging, but instead of having a readout and phase encode gradients, we have two gradients that look a lot like the readout gradient, but are scaled by a sine and a cosine of the angle of the projection. We can also look at what we will call radial imaging or radial out imaging, where we start from k equals zero and sample outward. This is similar to full projection, but we use center out readouts as shown on the right. This gives you the shortest TE of any sequence because it is the fastest way to get to any resolution. You have a low first moment because you're starting in the middle and this can improve motion sensitivity. Again, this is the fastest way to reach high spatial frequencies. We have to consider the impact of delays and we sometimes have to consider the impact of sampling while we are ramping up the gradients. This is the radial out sequence. Again, we have an excitation, but notice now that we have a very short TE because we start in the center of K-space. We actually often replace this excitation with a non-selective excitation or a faster excitation to shorten the TE even more for specific applications. Again, the gradients are uh, simply scaled by the sine and the cosine of the angle of the radial out segment here. Notice that there are no preparatory gradients and no rewinder gradients here. So this is what the trajectories will look like. Of course, they will follow different angles and read out across from the center out. So now let's look at a question that explores the design considerations of radial and projection imaging. Question is, what is the readout resolution of a line of k-space? And here, we see that for a simple line here, the readout resolution will be the same as Cartesian. And this can be seen because the line is actually identical to a Cartesian readout here. What is the field of view of radial or projection imaging along the readout 
Again, this is the same as Cartesian because nothing has changed on this first line here. The next question is how many angles do you need to achieve this field of view in the image? Here, we'll see that we need uh, more, more lines here for full projection imaging than Cartesian, and we need uh, twice as many for radial out because we're only sampling half of k-space on the radial out approach. Notice that n read here is the number of points across the full projection for these calculations. So it will look something like this. We sample this full disk here, and if you look at the distance between the samples at the edge of k-space, this is how we come to this uh, number because the spacing of the samples at the edge of the k-space is uh, equal to the spacing between the samples along the readout, just as it would be in Cartesian imaging where the x and the y field of view are the same. Notice we can also undersample this trajectory and there are implications of this that we will show a little later on. Now let's look at a question that shows what are the actual numbers for this kind of a design. So if we have a Cartesian 256 by 256 image, this requires 256 excitations. The question is, how many are required for full projection imaging? So the answer here is simply 256 times pi over 2, which is approximately 400 excitations. So how many do we need if the readout instead is radial out? And the answer now is about double that. How many points do we need along the readout for full projection imaging? And the answer here is again 256. This is the same as Cartesian and for radial out. Here we would need 128 points. Now this might be slightly variable because you might be sampling during the ramp up period of the gradient. So let's now look at the reconstruction for projection or radial imaging. Notice here that we have non-Cartesian sampling. Our samples are no longer on a grid, so we have to reconstruct this in a different way. One approach is to use something called filtered back projection, which is similar to what's used in CT. Another more common approach in MRI is to use gridding and a fast Fourier transform. And here, what we try to do is grid the samples or interpolate the samples onto a Cartesian grid. So in order to do this, first we have to do what's called density compensation, where we do some local weighting based on the density of samples around the grid point that we are interpolating onto. We can use a density compensation based on the k-space radius. And this is actually common to both gridding and filtered back projection. And then we will interpolate the samples onto a grid point using some kind of a convolution kernel. So here you see the grid point and the convolution kernel, which is basically weighting the points around the grid point uh, so that we can average them together to uh, obtain the sample at the grid point. There are numerous choices of how you do critting reconstruction, and these will affect the point spread function width and side lobes. Because we have non-uniform sampling, we need to talk about the SNR efficiency of the projection and radial sequences. So usually we use a gridding reconstruction as just described. For projection or radial, the density is equal to K max divided by kr. So of course at the center the density is very high and at the edge the density is low. So we can compensate for this by multiplying by 1 over the density or simply by kr or kr over k max. So the question is how does this approach all affect the signal to noise ratio? So the first thing to note is that it takes more samples to cover a given area A and this results in an efficiency loss as shown here. So the number of samples is actually the integral of the density. But because we are oversampling at the middle, we are taking more samples. So we have to 
compensate by multiplying by a square root of this uh, of this function here. We also, when we consider the multiplication by one over d, we are scaling the noise variance so that the overall uh, sigma for the noise is the square root of 1 over a times the integral over a of 1 over d times the sample variance squared here. So what we're doing is we're doing a weighted average of the variance across the sample points due to the multiplication by the um, density compensation here. So if we put this together, we have an overall efficiency that looks like this. Eta is equal to a, which is the sampling area, divided by the square root of uh, basically the product of integrals of d and 1 over d integrated over that area. Notice that the noise is also colored. It looks a little bit more like a speckly noise or a salt and pepper noise. And this is because the noise will be higher in the higher spatial frequencies than in the low spatial frequencies. This is often a subtle effect though that's not that noticeable. So let's look at this again. If we look at for radial sampling, the number of samples per unit area of K space. In Cartesian imaging, if we have n by n samples, we sample an area of four times K max squared. For radial imaging, we require pi over two times as many samples, and we actually sample a smaller area here. So this is what radial looks like again. So if we look at how many samples are required per unit area, we see that we have the ratio here, pi over two, times the ratio of the areas. And therefore we see that we actually need two times as many samples per unit area here. So this gives us a penalty of one over square root two because we're having to scan for twice as long. If we look at the noise variance, we average this over K space. Again, this is the average of KR, which is the density compensation function. So this is like averaging um, a pillbox minus a cone. So it's sort of like the, uh, if you take out a cone from a, a cylinder, you're left with uh, KR and we're averaging that over the circle. And this leads to two thirds, which can be seen from the volume of a cone. And therefore the overall efficiency is one over the square root of two times two thirds. And this is the square root of three over two or 0.87. And again, as I mentioned, the noise is no longer white, it's high frequency or salt and pepper. So we can look at this in one more format, uh, quickly comparing radial projection imaging to Cartesian imaging. So if we look at the K-space area, we look at the number of samples needed to cover the area, we look at the integrated density compensation, and we can compare these for Cartesian and radial, and we get to the same number here. So this is kind of a nice way to break this down and look at how these numbers interact. And again, the real take home point here is to notice that the density variation affects the efficiency of the SNR. So let's now look at a design example for radial outward sampling. Imagine that we desire 0.5 millimeter resolution over a 20 centimeter field of view. How many radial spokes do we need to acquire this image with full sampling? So first let's look at the k max that we need. The k max extent is 1 over 2 times 0.5 millimeters, which is 1 inverse millimeter, which is 1000 inverse meters. Delta k is 1 over field of view, which is 0 0.05 inverse centimeters or 5 inverse meters. So we can look at the circumference of the circle here and see that this is uh, 2 pi times k max, or a total of 6,283 inverse meters. So if we divide this by 5, we get that we need 1,257 spokes. 
This should not surprise us because given the numbers here, 20 centimeters divided by 0.5 millimeters would give us about 400, and this is 400 times pi. And for this sampling, what is the minimum readout duration? And here you need to go back to uh, homework number one, perhaps. So we, what we do is we first look at the gradient area here to achieve 1,000 inverse meters or 10 inverse centimeters. And from homework one, we, we made this plot here that gives us the fastest, uh, the minimum gradient duration to reach this area we see that this is about 0.8 milliseconds. Of course, this would depend on the, the maximum amplitude and slew rate of the system. Let's now look at the point spread function in projection reconstruction and the effect of undersampling. So first, note that the point spread function has a ring of aliasing. Instead of having aliased replicas, the energy is spread out in k-space, so it's actually less coherent. There's some intuition here that there's no preferred direction for a coherent peak in radial imaging because the technique has radial symmetry here. So this is the point spread function, and you see that the signal is high in the middle, and this is somewhat amplified to show that beyond some distance, which is the field of view, we have signal here in the point spread function that will lead to interference or aliasing. Another point is that undersampling tends to result in streak artifacts. And there's a way to explain this, that the harmonic is perpendicular to the direction to the side lobe in the aliasing, which we'll do in this diagram here. So here is an undersampled radial or projection uh, uh, sampling trajectory here. So you see that the space delta k theta here is quite a bit bigger than the spacing along the trajectory here. So what will be the impact of this? So what we can do is we can look at the point spread function that arises from this. So of course we have a large signal right in the middle with most point spread functions. If we think about the field of view here, um, the direction where we will have a reduced field of view is the direction of the spacing between these samples here. So this is this direction in the point spread function. And then if we think about what is the signal at that location in k-space, this is what the spatial harmonic might look like at that location. So then we look at the tip of the arrow here and we can realize that we're going to have aliasing of that spatial frequency. Now, if we repeat this going all the way around the circle, this leads to the spokes. And you can see at the arrow here, some of the spokes that we have in the point spread function. So again, the point spread function will be the convolution with the actual image. Um, when you convolve the point spread function with the actual image, you'll be able to see the streaking artifact. So this is sort of an explanation of how undersampling and projection imaging leads to um, these streaking artifacts. And indeed, any point spread function for radial imaging will have sp sort of a spoke-like point spread function. What matters is the distance of these spokes from the center. So here are some uh, examples of undersampled projection imaging, and these lead to streak artifacts. So you see in these images, as we undersample by a higher and higher rate here, the num the, uh, we see increasing amounts of these streak artifacts. And it turns out that by using reasonable undersampling rates, the artifact is often quite benign. And in fact, even in the image at the right, one could argue that you can st still see the vessels very clearly, although it's starting to degrade. Now let's look at the impact of gradient delays with respect to sampling on these trajectories. So if we have full projection imaging, we can have two uh, possibilities here. So first, if we have a simple delay between the gradients, and the sampling, we can shift the center along the trajectory, which is the dashed white arrow here. If we have different delays between X and Y, we may actually miss the center altogether. So here is shown the trajectory if the KY gradient uh, precedes the X gradient. And here you see that the trajectory actually 
curves a little at the beginning because one gradient starts before the other and we may actually miss the center entirely. In radial out imaging, there are similar effects here. If we have a global delay, this will shift along the trajectory, but if the Y gradient precedes the X gradient as shown here, you can actually warp the trajectory as shown by the yellow arrow here. So in both cases, if these gradient, uh, gradient delays are a problem, these will need to be corrected in the reconstruction or during the sampling. Let's also look at off resonance effects. Now, while radial imaging is often done to do very fast imaging, uh, it's important to understand the off resonance effects. So here, what we've shown is a phase, uh, a phase plot going from zero to pi, going from the center out here. So it's zero to pi of phase variation during the trajectory. This would correspond to one full cycle across a Cartesian readout. And recall that that would lead to one pixel shift. So here the point spread function is actually broadened by this effect. And compared to the reference, you can see that there's broadening right at the center where we've amplified to show the central five by five pixels of the point spread function. If we have full projection imaging, here we have a minus pi to pi phase variation. Notice that uh, there's a bit of an, uh, we lose the radial symmetry in this case because we're sampling from one side to the other. Here the point spread function is broadened, but also has a shift in it because we can see that if we image along the ky axis here, uh, this looks just like a Cartesian re, um, acquisition. So this should lead to a shift of that trajectory. So here we see the combined effects here uh, compared to the reference. Now again, because these sequences typically image as fast as possible, these effects are often quite subtle. Another variation for projection reconstruction is to do 3D imaging. So here, what we often do is sample along this, th these 3D spokes, which resemble a Kush ball. And here you're going to encode in Kx, Ky, and Kz and essentially what we have to do is parameterize the endpoints of the spokes. We can still image from one side to the other or from center out. The density compensation now is a KR squared. The SNR efficiency, as we'll show, now drops to 0.75 because we have even greater oversampling at the middle. However, we can undersample this even more highly and get away with higher undersampling factors because this oversampling at the center is often beneficial. So here's an example. This is an, an angiogram here, and you can see the vessels very clearly, and this is using a 3D projection reconstruction scheme. And what we find is that by oversampling the middle, this is actually quite insensitive to motion. So in the, in the uh, chest here, uh, there's some motion due to breathing, and, and cardiac motion, and this trajectory is quite insensitive. So let's look at the signal to noise ratio efficiency, eta here. Remember now that the radial density is now uh, k max over kr squared, and we're sampling over the same k space extent in all three dimensions. So let's look at the same table we used for radial imaging. We have the k space volume here, shown here, and this is eight eight in Cartesian, and it will be four thirds pi for the uh, 3D radial imaging. The number of samples needed is the integral of the density. For Cartesian, it will be eight. For, for uh, 3D radial, it will actually be four times pi. And if we integrate the density compensation factor, we'll actually have eight and we'll have four fifths pi here. And this leads to the overall efficiency of a square root five over three or 0.75. And again, it's that density variation that affects the SNR efficiency. Let's look now at temporal sampling of radial and projection patterns. It's interesting to look at this trajectory on the right and look at the tips of the arrows here and what you notice is that the distance between the tips of the arrows is the same as the distance between the tips of uh, every second arrow if you go to half the k-space extent 
So what this means is we can actually sample a full field of view image if we're willing to tolerate a lower resolution by using a lower number of spokes. So we can use this trick to vary the spatio-temporal resolution or the spatial vary resolution uh, combined with the temporal resolution or sampling over time. So one approach to do this is called QUIC, which stands for K-Space Weighted Image Contrast. Here the odd line, uh, spokes are sampled first and then the even spokes. And what you can do is you can use the central K-Space information to reconstruct high frame rate, lower resolution images. And then you can actually share information from successive frames uh, where you use this, the low spatial frequency information from uh, say the even radial lines. And you use that to make a low resolution image. And then you can add in the high spatial frequency from the even and the odd lines here and then what you'll get is that the higher spatial frequencies you're sampling over a larger uh, temporal window, which we'll talk about later, or temporal footprint. So you get a little bit of blurring of contrast, but not much. So it's actually quite a clever technique. You can also use this concept to generate a field map by delaying the odd versus the even lines. And then what you can do is reconstruct images at two echo times using the central uh, k-space information from the odd and from the even lines. And this will generate a field map, which you can then use to correct the full acquisition. And then another thing that's very common is to uh, sample using, by incrementing the angle by about 111 degrees. And this angle is expressed here. And what this gives you is the property that an arbitrary number of samples has sort of a uniform distribution of the angles. So what you see is as you sample here, the distribution of the angles uh, is fairly uniform around the circle, even though the density of the spokes is actually increasing over time. One final comment about radial imaging is a technique called zero echo time imaging. And this is inherently a radial sequence. In this sequence, the gradients are actually always on, even during the RF pulses. So what we've done is we've taken the entire sequence and really crunched this down here. Uh, so you can see the gradients, and these gradients actually correspond to uh, different angles um, around the unit uh, sphere here. So what happens is uh, we have very short RF pulses. This leads to very sh low SAR. The RF excites a little bit of a signal, and because the gradients are on, this reads out radially in k-space. Um, now, actually, because the gradients are on, this RF is slightly selective, although this is generally not a problem. But you can generate these very interesting images where you can image very short T2 structures, such as the cortical bone, and then you can combine these in different ways uh, to make different kinds of contrast. So this is an interesting application of radial imaging. So this brings us to our summary. Radial and projection imaging use a higher number of excitations than Cartesian imaging to sample around a circle in k-space. Because this is a non-Cartesian acquisition, we require some kind of a special reconstruction, usually gridding. Because of the increased number of excitations, as well as the variation of sampling density, we lose SNR efficiency. If we undersample these techniques, it causes a streak-like artifact, which is reflected in the point spread function. If we have off-resonance, this can cause blurring instead of a shift, as in Cartesian imaging. And then there are variations of these sampling schemes that we've shown, such as 3D variations, temporal sampling, and zero echo time approaches. So now a question you may have is can we improve the center out sampling efficiency of these sampling uh, techniques? And to do this, you should watch the next lecture on spiral imaging.